Hello, and thank you for joining us today. My name is Meg Mason. I'm the Marketing Director here at HydroPoint Data Systems, and welcome to our third edition in our new educational webinar series focusing on outsmarting the drought. Uh, we're aiming for this webinar to last uh, 20 to 25 minutes with a short question and answer section at the end. Should you need to jump off at any time, don't worry. We're recording this entire webinar and it will be posted on our website afterwards. At any time if you have any trouble, feel free to type in your issues into the chat section on the right hand side and we will respond to them. As well, there's a Q&A section on the right hand side so if you have any questions at all for um, the moderator or the guest speaker, feel free to ask those questions there and we will address them at the end. So I will move ahead with introducing our moderator today, which is Peter Carlson. Here, he's the co-founder of HydroPoint Data Systems here, um, and he's the VP of Product Management and Technology. So Peter, I will hand it over to you. Thanks, Meg. And uh, thanks to everybody who's taking time out from their busy days to join us. Um, I know this is a busy time with lots of fast-changing information, so we hope this will help everybody learn a little bit more and, <clears throat> and uh, provide a really frank discussion about water conservation strategies that we, as we face the current drought. Um, to be clear, this is not going to be an advertising platform uh, for any vendor, including HydroPoint, but rather a candid review of what has worked and, equally important, what has failed, presented by people who have been working for water conservation long before the current crisis. Today, I'd like to introduce our guest speaker, Clint Collins, the Senior Director of Landscape Operations uh, for the Irvine Company Office Properties. Hi, Peter. Hey, Hi. Clint. Uh, so Clint's been, uh, Clint's been working at the Irvine Company for eight years. He has a, a degree in ornamental horticulture and also has other multiple certifications. He's a member of the Board of Directors of BOMA of Orange County, and prior to working at the Irvine Company, worked for uh, Valley Crest Landscape for 28 years as a branch manager with over 150 employees. Uh, Clint is currently responsible for the Irvine Company office portfolio consisting of over 500 buildings, 30 million square feet of landscape, 12 million square feet of turf, and over 50,000 trees. Uh, some of his responsibilities include selection of landscape contractors, bidding out portfolios, awarding contracts, and managing contractors' performance and landscape water use. So we wanted to thank you, Clint, for joining us today and really talking about um, how, how this drought would be affected by the overall retail properties and really um, are really affected by the drought and kind of the, the different impacts from the governor's mandate. So, yeah, my pleasure. from your perspective, what has changed for you and the gov and the Irvine Company since the governor's executive order on April 1st? Well, the biggest change is the mandatory water reduction percentages on the potable water for each water agency, and that's a really important distinction. All of these mandates only apply to potable water. Prior to this, the water reductions had pretty much been voluntary. Unfortunately, not enough people took that seriously, and they didn't make the changes that have been long overdue. And the other big one for us is that mandate where you have to turn off all the water to city medians that have turf on potable water. What, uh, what percentage of your, uh, of your irrigation is potable water versus reclaimed? Uh, statewide, we're 48% uh, uh, potable and 52% reclaimed. But here in Irvine, where we've been pioneering the use of it, we actually helped build the first reclamation center in 1968. Uh, we're over 70% with uh, wow. many more online coming, you know, conversions to reclaim tenants. And then, and then following up on what you had said um, about the mandate to turn off uh, water to medians, how do you think that will affect the, your, the overall appeal and or your plant palette? Well, the medians for us uh, happen to be in one of our, our most important areas in Newport Beach. So, I mean, there's no way we can just have dead turf medians, you know, that, it just doesn't work. So basically we're going to have to 
you know, look at other alternatives, including uh, re-landscaping with drip and drought-tolerant shrubs. What steps have you taken to address water efficiency? Well, you know, since the Irvine Company was founded, you know, we were originally an agricultural company, and, you know, we've been in business more than 150 years. And we've been thoughtful stewards of some of the most valuable land anywhere, conserving and reusing water by all means available. And we strive to build and operate our communities and properties in a sustainable, environmentally sensitive way. And throughout our long history, you know, we've experienced numerous droughts, and we've made major investments in programs and pioneered systems and infrastructure designed to reduce that water usage up front, and then extensively reclaim and reuse that water whenever possible. Like I was saying, we pioneered the use of reclaimed water, and in the mid-70s, uh, we started using it for apartments, office, retail, and communities in the city of Irvine. Um, basically, you know, I think you can break good water conservation down into three best practice categories. The first one would be the upgrading of your irrigation infrastructure. Uh, we use smart controllers. We currently have more than 470 of the weather track controllers just in office properties alone. Uh, we've converted to low flow sprinklers in the turf areas. This helps the soil to absorb the water instead of running off onto the hardscape. We use drip irrigation where possible, especially in parking lot islands, which has the added benefit of reducing costs for repairing water damage on asphalt. And we use master valves with flow sensing uh, as much as possible to prevent water loss due to mainline breaks and stuck valves. This has become an even greater priority due to the recent changes in the law making any runoff illegal and subject to fines. I think the second best practice is basically the cultural stuff. And that's greater emphasis on installing low water use plant material on all properties going forward and on some retrofits, reducing the amount of turf grass, you know, and keep in mind, focus your efforts on your potable systems. That's where you get the biggest bang for your buck right now. I would try to keep your footprint about 30%. Mulching to retain soil moisture. We always try to keep at least a two inch layer of mulch at all times to help, you know, keep the water from evaporating. And minimizing the scalping and overseeding of turf areas. You know, we used to do that annually, and now we just do it in very select areas, if at all, because it takes a lot of water to germinate new seed. And the third best practice is the partnering and accountability. You know, just the infrastructure alone won't do it. You have to partner with your vendors and with the owners. So one of the things we require is a monthly irrigation inspection. This is hugely important. You know, irrigation systems have a lot of rubber and plastic in them, and they need constant attention. If nobody's paying attention to that, you're in inevitably be going to have uh, leaks and be wasting water. Super important to water to your local ET and make sure your vendors know what that allocation is each week based on that ET. And then we also require them to read the water meter every week to make sure they're on track to stay with that allocation. So it's really important that you have some sort of informational campaign to educate the public on that. Then moving to more of a big picture kind of thing, I think the single best strategy uh, in this particular mandate is to pursue converting any potable property to reclaimed water. If you do that, you're going to be exempt from all the regulations, and it's the right thing to do for landscape. Um, and another tactic would be working with your water agencies to try to get them to adopt a tiered rate system based on ET allocations using warm season grass as a crop coefficient. That's the model used uh, by the IRWD here in Irvine, who are, I think are some of the leaders in uh, water management. And if you upgrade to those infrastructures I just talked about, it's really not difficult to water that standard. Any districts that go to a limited mandatory watering day, you know, that's a great sound bite. It makes it sound like you're doing something, but it's actually not really effective in saving water. And it actually works against you if you've invested in low flow and other water savings technologies. You don't have a long enough water window to get the water out there. So during those situations, people are going to tend to flood irrigate, and a lot of that water is just going to run off and go into the storm drains, which is sad. And then uh, turf, you know, that's become the villain here. And it does use about 40% more water than non-turf on average. So a good strategy is to try to reduce your percentage of turf on your potable systems to the low water use shrubs with drip and take advantage of any uh, available rebates. Like I said, I would try to keep your footprint to about 30% of your landscape on the potable. Another strategy, you can, can convert your existing turf grass to like a native grass or a buffalo grass, something like that. A lot of these varieties use 75% less water than our standard tall fescue. 
But don't think you're getting a tall fescue, nice, beautiful mowed lawn. They're just not that. They're not as green and lush, and uh, a lot of them go dormant in the winter. And then, you know, you can always go uh, full bore and completely re-landscape a property with full drought-appropriate landscape pallet with drip and low flow. Uh, that'll get you out of the woods forever, but, you know, it's, it is a very expensive uh, option to go. Thanks, Clay. I'm just going to go back and, and ask a few quick questions. Um, as you were just talking about, if you were to do the re-landscaping, it is very expensive to do that re-landscaping. You know, how does that affect the property appeal? It's... You know, it's a brand new thing. People aren't used to seeing, you know, mesquites and palo verdes and aloes and succulents, uh, you know, especially here in Irvine. Uh, and, and we're starting to experiment with in limited places right now, and uh, we're considering doing it on a larger scale on some select properties to see how people react to it. But it is something new and different, you know. I think if you're a horticulturist, you, you totally like it, but, you know, it, it, it's a different thing to, to get used to, for sure. Yeah. I agree. I think I think it'll it'll potentially the public may start to change what what aesthetic is uh, is appealing to them as as this goes forward. Yeah. I also wanted to go back to one of the points that you had brought up before, which was in partnering and accountability um, with your vendors. Yeah. Um, you had talked about that and how you um, you have these different vendors like landscape maintenance contractors, um, and how do you um, how do you work with them to ensure that you know they're meeting that re your your requirement? Uh, we work really closely with all of our vendors and try to have the, the best companies in every market working for us. So we get the ET allocation from uh, whatever water district we're in, and we provide that to the vendors, and so they know how much they're supposed to water each week, and then they go out and read the water uh, meters every week to make sure they're using you know, 25% of the allocation the first week, 50% the second week, and so forth. So they have, you know, basically four chances to make those adjustments. Then at the end of the month, or well, the following month, we'll sit down and we'll look at the water bills with them, and we'll kind of see how they did. Found that that's the best way to, to get their attention and, and hold them accountable. But that only works if you're willing to pay for the infrastructure upgrades. You know, otherwise it's not fair to them. Yeah, I think that, uh, you know, I think you guys are one of the, the companies I know that have really pioneered, you know, bringing your landscape uh, contractors and vendors in as uh, partners and then having them be part of that account accountability chain. And, and uh, it looks like it's worked really well for you guys. I, I, that's the only way it will work. You know, this is definitely a partnership. They can't do it on their own. We can't do it on our own. In moving to the next question, what, what have been some of the biggest surprises with implementing smart water practices? You know, probably our biggest surprise was that even though our vendors were eager to sell us the upgrades to more efficient systems, they weren't all up to speed in how to operate them. We experienced a long learning curve, particularly with the smart controllers, which are a bit complex. But we did expensive partnering with our vendors to make sure they received the training they needed to properly operate these controllers. That's one of the reasons it's really crucial to pick a smart controller company that provides, you know, really extensive ongoing customer support. And just to give you guys a, a quick plug, we found that WeatherTrack to be an invaluable asset in this effort. You've been great in helping us get everybody trained on that. But Thanks. also, since water is kind of still relatively cheap, really, it's it's a pretty long ROI on this. Yeah, I, I think uh, I think if you're if you are irrigating that lower tier, um, then it can be you know a relatively um, or you know that that water is still pretty cheap. What we've typically seen is a payback for our installations of typically less than three years. So I think because you guys have been ahead of the game and been managing to that, you guys are able to keep it at that lowest tier. But for many of what we've seen in the marketplace, for many of the other retail centers or, or other property owners, they're at that, those upper tiers, which provide a, a faster payback. Yeah, sure. Yeah, it depends uh, what, what's, where you're at when you first start with it. How will stricter water restrictions affect property values and asset management? Well, you know, this is, of course, one of the biggest concerns in the industry. It's going to be incredibly hard to market a Class A property if the landscape's suffering. You know, and unfortunately, turf grass has been vilified in this scenario, when really the real culprit is that there's still significant percentages of turf being watered by extremely inefficient irrigation systems managed by people who still think turf needs daily watering. The focus really needs to be on improving system efficiency and proper controller programming. If we're forced to eliminate turf and let other parts of the landscape stress out, 
it's not only going to affect the property values, but it's going to actually contribute to greater global warming and significant erosion of our quality of life, in my opinion. And I think this gets back to that question of, you know, what is the uh, an aesthetic for the for the plant palette, as well as um, you know, getting into how do we make sure that that water being put down is being put down, you know, at the right the right amount of water is being put down at the right time. Right. Yeah. It, it's not that hard. You know, you just got to pay attention. What is your most uh, spectacular success, failure, and your worst fear? Well, probably our biggest success with respect to water use is that on average, we're only using 65% of our ET allocation. And that's a result of paying attention, partnering with our vendors, and investments in the modern irrigation infrastructure. As far as failure, it would be at this point in time the state is asking for water reductions based on past use. Since we've already been really responsible with our water use for many years, if not decades, it makes it much more difficult for us to squeeze out the extra savings without dramatically sacrificing quality. And my worst fear would, would be that if enough people don't step up to the plate and start doing the right thing with their water use, the mandates could get even stricter in the future. If we get in a situation where we can only water once a week in the summer, or maybe even all outdoor irrigation gets turned off, our entire industry, both landscape and real estate, would be impacted in a, a really, really dramatic way. You know, we happen to live in a state that historically has been prone to drought. This one's going to pass as well, but there will be one after this, and there'll be another one after that, and so forth. We need to get away from this kind of roller coaster, drastic response, and then do nothing when the rain's back to normal. You know, if we all work together to make permanent changes in how we water our landscapes more intelligently, that will be cost effective and sustainable over the long haul, you know, we can solve this problem once and for all. And I think that's a, that's a great perspective, and, um, you know, great going forward. Um, is there anything that the Irvine Company is doing as a company to promote that water conservation in the areas that you're in to kind of a greater um, your your neighbors and or the community? Yeah, we're uh, we're putting together some um, informational press releases right now that are going to go out in the next few weeks uh, to the community and to all our customers. You know, explaining what we've been doing and you know trying to encourage others to to adopt these kind of best practices because you know. No matter how well we do as an individual or you guys do as individuals, they're they're looking at the water use by each district, not by individuals. So if, if the homeowners don't get on board, everything we do commercially is not going to matter, and the restrictions could get even worse. Well, um, thank you, Clint. I think now is our time for our audience uh, question and answer. Yes, definitely. So we have uh, one question from Doris. Uh, question is, who manages the irrigation controllers on your properties? Is this something that's outsourced or a landscaping company takes care of it? Now, each of our vendors, I have um, basically 17 maintenance contractors working for me uh, up and down the state. And, you know, if we're going to hold them responsible for penalties, you know, then they have to be in charge of that controller. So we do give them extensive training and we have the ability to look at their programs online. Uh, we get alerts, you know, through our emails and all that. So, you know, we, we give our input, but it's ultimately up to the vendor to make that call. And one other question, too, just um, going back to how you uh, have the difference between potable and reclaimed water. I know um, a lot of your irrigation is on reclaimed water. What type of systems do you needed to be in place in order for your, you know, outdoor irrigation to to be purely reclaimed water? Is that something that, you know, the average homeowner could get set up? Or what's the process in getting that those systems in place? You have to work with your local water agency. There are reclaimed pipes uh, in many areas, and some areas there's not. So you have to find out where the nearest reclaimed pipe is to your property. And then in some cases, the water agency will pay to, to bring the line farther down. And, like, you wouldn't do it just for an individual house. You do it for an entire community. Um, but, you know, it's it's fairly involved. You have to, you know, change all your sprinkler heads to purple caps. Uh, you have to put in basket strainers, change out the backflow. You know, it's, it's kind of an expensive process, but it will get you out of the woods permanently. And I think it's the right thing to do, which is why we're going to be putting a lot of effort into that. That's great. That's great. Well, anything else, Clint, um, you want to mention or throw in before we go ahead and sign off? No, no, I, th I think I've, I've covered it all. 
Well, perfect. Well, thank you, everybody, um, for joining us. Um, Peter, thank you for being our moderator today. Thanks, Meg. Um, looking forward to it. Next week, we have um, Rachel from Kaiser set up for our webinar for next week, and we have a couple others set up as well. So feel free to check out our website. It's hydropoint.com slash drought. And from there, you're, there's a bunch of different resources, um, including this webinar series and some other uh, information regarding drought compliance and frequently asked questions. Have a great day.